beneath Egypt's burning sands, in a hidden chamber untouched for millennia, flashlight beams dance across ancient walls. There, emblazoned in ochre and charcoal, are scenes that defy the desert outside. Towering trees spread a lush canopy across the rock, trees of a kind seen today only in rain-soaked jungles. Painted beneath their boughs, unfamiliar animals roam and drink from blue streams. This is no mirage. It's a message from a time when the Sahara was green, teeming with life, when Egypt was a jungle. The archaeologists who first gazed upon these images stood in stunned silence, realizing they were looking at a lost world. In vivid strokes, the cave's artists captured an Egypt of long ago, a land of greenery and water that scientists now know thrived around 8000 BC, during the African humid period. Back then, the Sahara was significantly greener and wetter than it is today, supporting forests and lakes where endless dunes now lie. Researchers found that people lived here for millennia in a savanna-like Eden until about 4000 BC, when climate change transformed the land into desert. This cave's breathtaking murals are like postcards from that vanished paradise, hard proof that the pharaoh's homeland was once a lush oasis. But could other ancient clues have been whispering this secret all along? On the Giza Plateau, the Great Sphinx of Giza has silently weathered 4,500 years of history. Yet some geologists see deeper scars in its body. Scars they believe rain, not wind, etched into the Sphinx's flanks. Vertical fissures snake down the Sphinx's enclosure walls, undulating erosion that looks eerily like damage from torrential rains. Geologist Robert Schoch recalls examining the Sphinx up close. I found heavy erosional features that I concluded could only have been caused by rainfall and water runoff, he reported. The implication sent shockwaves through archaeology. The Sphinx sits on the edge of the Sahara, a place bone dry for at least five millennia. If rainfall carved those deep channels, it means the Sphinx may have stood under pounding rains thousands of years earlier than we thought, perhaps around 7000 BC, when North Africa's skies still opened in monsoon downpours. In that distant epoch, early Holocene Egypt was verdant, dotted with lakes and drenched in seasonal storms. The water erosion theory remains controversial, but it aligns with what this newfound cave art proclaims. Ancient Egypt knew seasons of plenty, an era when its deserts bloomed. Egypt's green past, once a radical idea, is now illuminated not only by one cave or one monument, but by a chorus of discoveries across the world. In Sudan's eastern desert, just south of Egypt, archaeologists recently discovered 16 rock art sites that left them awestruck. Chiseled into remote cliffs are elegant images of long-horned cattle and even boats sailing across what is now barren sand. The cattle rock art is very significant, as cattle can no longer live in this hyper-arid desert. Notes archaeologist Julian Cooper, whose team found these carvings. To him, that lone image of a cow led by a herder is clear evidence that this harsh wilderness was once a hospitable grassland. Such scenes could only have been painted by people who wandered with their herds through green pastures, in an era scientists call the African Humid Period. In this period before 5,000 years ago, the Sahara was much wetter, and cattle herders roamed the deserts in search of pasture, Cooper explains. Today, only hardy camels and goats survive here, but those ancient carvings freeze a memory in stone, a time when water and life were plentiful in places that now seem eternally dry.
And it's not just North Africa. Half a world away, in the deepest Amazon rainforest, explorers recently uncovered a treasure trove of prehistoric art stretching for miles. There, on rock faces normally smothered by jungle vines, are painted processions of mastodons, giant ground sloths, and Ice Age horses. These creatures once ambled through a landscape utterly unlike today's steamy Amazon. At the end of the last Ice Age, around 12,000 years ago, the Amazon was still transforming into the tropical forest we recognize today, explains archaeologist Mark Robinson. Back then, rising temperatures were changing a patchwork of savannas and thorny scrub into the dense rainforest we know now. The artwork captures that transition in breathtaking detail. Human figures hunt alongside savanna beasts, and they tend plants and trees that have long since vanished beneath the canopy. Robinson was astonished, saying, The paintings give a vivid and exciting glimpse into the lives of these communities. It is unbelievable to us today to think they lived among and hunted giant herbivores, some which were the size of a small car. His voice echoes our own awe, that sense of time's grand sweep, turning grasslands to jungle or jungle to desert, all within the span of human memory. As we uncover the secrets of Egypt's lush past, it raises an even more intriguing question. What if other parts of the world, once thought to be barren, were once thriving with life. Imagine a time when the frozen expanse of Antarctica was not a desolate, icy wasteland, but a vibrant jungle. In our next video, we'll explore how a recently discovered ancient map could rewrite history, revealing that Antarctica, too, was once a lush green paradise. Don't miss this jaw-dropping discovery. One thing that they used to say is Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it. Right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. Graham Hancock's interpretation of the Piri race map created in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis, presents a fascinating narrative about the knowledge of ancient civilizations. The map, discovered in 1929 in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, has only about one-third of its original content preserved. Despite this, the map's detail and coverage, including parts of Europe, North Africa, and the Brazilian coast, are noteworthy. The scale of the map is inconsistent, a common feature in early cartography, and it includes various annotations and illustrations. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. Piri Reis himself indicated that the map was compiled using various earlier sources, including charts from Christopher Columbus and possibly older maps, which might have included Western and Eastern, including Arabic navigational charts. Hancock's interpretation of the map primarily focuses on its depiction of the Antarctic coastline. He claims that the map shows the northern coastline of Antarctica in a largely ice-free state, which, according to him, last occurred more than 6,000 years ago.